Hi friends, Molten here and welcome back to my journey to GM series. So today I'm going to go over the most painful game I've ever played during my chess career and it happened while I was hunting for my third and final international master norm during the Gibraltar Masters Open Tournament in 2007. In the final round in a must win situation I went for a really uh, ambitious attack with the King's Gambit and it almost paid off before stumbling at the very end. And it was a very valuable lesson which I still remember to this day so stick around and I hope you learn a thing or two from this video. So the following game was played in the Gibraltar Masters in the final round where I had to win in order to secure my third and final international master norm. So Gibraltar is one of my favorite tournaments, it's a British colony off the southern coast of Spain and it's a fantastic event which brings together some of the best players in the world which you wouldn't otherwise get a chance to play or meet in person. So in this must win situation I went for a really aggressive um, opening which is one of the favorite openings which I've played ever since I was a junior and that's the King's Gambit. So I played f4 here and my opponent she took here pawn takes f4 and I went for bishop c4 which is my go-to move here as opposed to knight f3 which would allow fisher defense after d6. So here my opponent opted for knight to e7. I played the move knight to c3. My opponent played pawn to c6 and now her idea is to push in the center with the move pawn to d5 and this game is a great example of how to push forward your attack building it slowly and then how to keep the initiative going throughout the game as well. So I played the move queen to f3 here, developing my queen, stopping the move pawn to d5 in the center. My opponent played knight to g6. Now she's threatening to maybe bring the knight into the e5 square, hitting the bishop and the queen. So we should stop that with the move pawn to d4. d6 was played and we continue with the move knight g to e2. Now the whole point of the king's gambit is to sacrifice the pawn and often we win it back while at the same time opening this f file which is important for later attacks. My opponent played queen to g3, queen to h4 check. Here we don't want to trade queens or move the king so we block with pawn to g3. Notice black can't capture because the queen can capture on the f7 square so we have queen g4. We don't want to trade queens of course so we move the queen back now b5 to attack the bishop, the bishop drops back to b3 and my opponent played the move pawn to b4. Now often in chess if you have an option of pressing forward with your initiative and going backwards you always want to press forward if you can if you have the, that option available and you should always be looking out for moves which push your pieces forward especially in an opening like the king's gambit. So here instead of moving it backwards to d1 I played the move knight to d5 using some tactics here. So if black captures we can capture back with the bishop and we can see that this rook in the corner is undefendable. So instead black took here, we take back with the knight, opening up some lines of attack on the f file, queen goes back to d7 and again we I don't want to move this knight backwards if I can keep it there on this aggressive outpost so instead I opted for the move bishop to a4. So just keeping the pressure going, keeping the pin here, putting black under some uh, pressure. Queen b7 unpins the queen and in this position I could have played the move bishop to d2 but I remembered back to something Tao must have said or quoted that it's often good to bring the bishop to g5 if you don't know where to bring this bishop and it's true you'll see that this bishop on g5 can become a very useful piece later on in terms of attacking the black king. Of course if black chases the bishop I'm very happy to just bring it back to d2 anyways so I thought it doesn't hurt to bring the bishop to g5. My opponent played bishop e6 and here there's no threat after bishop e6 so I simply castled. Knight goes to d7 and here I spent a long long time. I spent maybe 30 to 40 minutes if I recall trying to come up with a way to keep the pressure going. And again I don't want to move my knight back if I don't have to. 
she's threatening to take the knight here with pawn uh, takes, pawn captures, and maybe queen captures. So after a long, long think, I came up with this sacrificial idea, rook h to e1. Just bringing another piece into the attack and saying the idea is that if black captures, then I was going to play the move knight to f5. And we get this very, very interesting um, position. The idea is that if she takes here, I'll take back, and then the opening of the e file will create some very dangerous um, counterplay for me. So here, black continued with pawn takes e4, and I had a long 15 minute think, the longest of the game, because I knew that the game was reaching a conclusion and I needed to be accurate in terms of my attack. I came up with the correct move, pawn to d5. The idea being that if bishop takes on f5, I would go queen takes, and the ideas of rook takes e4, bishop c6, and sacrifices on e5 would be very, very strong for me. So after d5, black played bishop takes d5, and now, if you want, you can pause the video and try to spend some time and work out what you would play here to continue the attack for white. Otherwise, if you just want to enjoy the answer, so in this position, I worked out initially that I was going to play the move rook takes d5, which is in fact the correct move. The idea being that if black does nothing, I will continue with the move rook takes d6, and black can't capture because I have a very nice knight fork on d6 afterwards. Therefore, if black takes the rook with queen takes d5, there's bishop b3, and after the queen moves, let's say to e5, then I have a very nice checkmate in 2 to finish off a nice attacking game. Knight takes d6, bishop takes, and queen takes f7 is a very nice checkmate. Instead, for some reason, after d5, bishop takes d5, I saw this variation, and I saw another variation which, for some reason, looked a lot prettier and I was very intrigued by this possibility of playing this variation and possibly winning a best game prize which I'd never won before so I said why not and after 50 minutes for some reason pieces in your head start shifting and the position I saw in my head was not the position that was on the board you'll see what I mean in a moment and I was intrigued by the idea of sacrificing all my pieces and getting a checkmate so I played rook take z4 instead and at first it'll look really really confusing but when I explain it it'll sort of make sense so after bishop takes e4 rook takes d6 was my main idea to attack this knight here with the rook and the bishop and my idea was that if the rook take the bishop takes the rook then I would take back and get this nice fork while at the same time if the bishop takes here on f5, my idea was to follow up with queen e3 check, and you have to remember that in my head I did not see this knight on g6, it was just not on the board. So in this position, all I could think about was black had two main options, queen e4, which would fall into queen takes, bishop takes, and bishop takes d7 was checkmate. And the only other option I saw in my head was bishop to e6 where I would sacrifice the rook after rook takes, queen takes, and of course after bishop e7, the knight not being on the board would be checkmate in one after queen takes e7. Of course, to my surprise, after queen e3 check, my opponent played bishop to e7 and I looked at the board and at first I thought it was checkmate in one and then all of a sudden I realized the knight had reappeared on the board on g6 and I just sat there in complete disbelief at the board because well I have no pieces left and I realized my whole combination didn't work and the fact that I threw the game because I didn't play rook takes d5 even though I saw the move initially so here I at this point I'd sort of given up already I didn't really know what to do but I continued with bishop c6 queen c7 and I have no more tricks left so I played the move rook takes g6 and this was probably the only time in my whole entire life where I have lost to the move 
castles and after castles I just have no pieces left so I had to resign this particular game in fact before resign after I resigned I sat there just staring at the board for the next 15 minutes straight so I was definitely disappointed after this particular game and the lost opportunity I had but one of my Australian teammates tried to cheer me up by saying that even if I found the move rook takes d5 I probably wouldn't have gotten the best game prize anyway I felt a lot better until the closing ceremony I remember or the gala dinner where I bumped into the grandmaster in charge of selecting the brilliancy prize who came up to me and said that Molten it's a shame you didn't play the move rook takes d5 because if you did you would have had a great shot at winning the brilliancy game and you know how I felt after that but it was a great reminder this game of just keeping things simple and not over complicating things if you already see a nice variation that's winning maybe that can be your main one and no need to get overly fancy so I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something I definitely learned a lot from playing this particular game as well as um, how to initiate a successful attack I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Take care.